Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I know some people are still trickling in, but I have a ridiculous number of slides and I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get through all of them, so I'll, I'll uh, start on time and we'll see what we can do. I'd, I'm hoping to, to, you know, zoom through a lot of these so that I can get to a point and even do a little Q&A because I have a feeling people will have some questions. Uh, my name is Noah Falstein. I'm uh, a longtime game developer. I actually started professionally in the business in 1980. And in 1984, I was lucky enough to become the seventh or, or eighth, depending on how you count it, uh, employee at what was then Lucasfilm Games and uh, shortly after became LucasArts Entertainment. And I'll be talking today about those early days and what it was like uh, since so many of you are, are developers, of course. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the coding. Um, I'm going to talk about the games because I'm just chatting with people when I, I was talking to Emily about doing another talk here besides the keynote, I asked her if um, she thought that there would be much interest in these you know, old games and what LucasArts was like. And she, she hesitated for a minute. And I said, oh, you're, you're worried that there won't be that many people interested. And she says, no, I'm, I'm worried it will pull too many people away from the other talks. So I'm, I'm happy to see she was right in her predictions. And I, I want to apologize if any of you see my other uh, co-speakers at this time. Um, Thinking back to what it was like in those early days, one of the things that hit me is that if I could talk to myself, you know, back in, in you know, 30 some years ago and explain what I was about to do, I think I'd be amazed at some of the technology. But the interesting thing is, of course, our phones would probably be the coolest thing that I would think. But close number two on the list would be the fact that it's no big deal. In fact, already seems kind of archaic that I've got a little laser I can point with because back in the early 80s that was you know something only uh, Flash Gordon and, and maybe you know a, a few NASA scientists had at their demand. So at any rate, enough of that odd perspective there. Um, this talk that I'm giving, uh, I owe a lot to uh, my friend David Fox, uh, not the least of which because he was my first contact when I, I interviewed and, and then came on board at Lucasfilm. And we've stayed good friends, as, as many of us have from those days. A lot of us are really still close and, and see each other all the time. He did this talk uh, about 10 years ago for, uh, I think, actually, Slush or, or uh, some uh, one of the other uh, Scandinavian uh, conferences. Uh, if any of you have seen that, um, be assured I've added a bunch of new slides. And his were very heavily aimed at the, the games that he had worked on. And, even though we overlapped, I've added more stuff about some of the games that I had some familiarity with and even so skipped over a number of them because there's just so much to cover. So with that, I'll, I'll just dive in, uh, talk about in general how uh, Lucasfilm got interested in doing video games and what was going on, why it started this, this group that, uh, that moved on from there. Um, and works great as a laser, not quite so good for lining up to, to click. Uh, but really, of course, it all came out of the original Star Wars movie in 1977. And it's a little hard to, to convey the magnitude of that movie now because big blockbusters uh, with special effects are happening literally you know, every week, if not every day, it seems. And at that point, it was just eye-opening and, and you know, an amazing thing that most of us who ended up working at Lucasfilm had had the experience of going to see that Star Wars movie on the first day or the first week and just opening our eyes to a, a whole new thing. As I was talking about it, my, my keynote yesterday had a, an amazing experience with VR and this was one of the things that reminded me of, of how when I saw that Star Destroyer coming overhead in the movie, how it changed things. Um, but let's dive in. So Star Wars was, was pretty world changing made a lot of money, uh, had some computers that a lot of those X-Wing uh, scenes that you saw in the first movie had computer control of cameras, but they were actual models that they used. And they went on, and in 1980, they, they went on to do uh, uh, Empire Strikes Back. But they're already starting to ask these questions about, is it possible to use computers to do some of the kind of graphics in movies? And they realized that there were a lot of impediments. It was going to take some time. But George has uh, always been a very forward-thinking man and decided, let's get a bunch of people together and start going. So they started the Lucasfilm Computer Division, 
Uh, what you see there actually is a shot of the back of uh, a satin jacket. Uh, and I, like I think a lot of my friends, still have them. And I, I thought about bringing it out here and wearing it, but that might have been a little bit too much and uh, trying to travel light here. But you know, it was a, a nerdy thing, but you know, I'm still proud to have that and bring it out on special occasions. So in spring 1982, uh, this was a time where George decided to form a group that would move beyond just the film side, and he knew that video games were starting to rise in importance. I think it's really intriguing that George himself actually has to this day, very little interest in computer video games, uh, just never really caught on for him. But he put uh, millions of dollars of his own money and a lot of effort into making a lot of this happen, as well as other high-tech things like the, the graphics people that went on to become Pixar and uh, a lot of video editing equipment. Uh, so I appreciate that he did that. We had a guy named Peter Langston, who was the first head of the group. The uh, second person he hired was David Fox, who, as I said, had done this, this uh, thing. This is Peter here in, in uh, those early days. Uh, he was a musician and was very interested in early computer music uh, research. Just, just before I joined the group, this is pretty much what it looked like. Um, everyone there except Lauren Carpenter was part of the, uh, what was called the games group of the computer division. Uh, Lauren was actually with the graphics group, and he was brought on temporarily. Lauren had done the uh, Genesis effect in the second Star Wars movie, The, the Wrath of Khan. And that was really groundbreaking as was if, of its use of computer graphics in film, which of course is commonplace today, but it was uh, really amazing at the time. And he was a very uh, high level, very smart computer scientist, still is. He's, he's a chief scientist at Pixar now. and. Um, very successful there, but he wanted to see could he take the stuff that was running on their high-level workstations and make it run on the one megahertz uh, toy computers essentially we had at the time in real time because a lot of the stuff they did for the movies of course was done offline with, with you know many hundreds of hours of rendering for just a, a few seconds of screen time. And he went on to do that. Uh, this was uh, the, the group as I met them when I came on board got an Atari 800 computer on the right there, which was the, the main target computer we were working with. And the idea was at first that they were going to just build a couple of throwaway games. George said, don't even worry about making money. It's actually kind of a joke that this group could ever make any amount of money that would have any uh, comparison to what the movies were making. And in fact, at the height of uh, the game divisions group, uh, you know, before it became LucasArts, at the height of their popularity, the best games that they could do would bring in about as much money as they were making from licensing just pajamas with Star Wars uh, on it. Uh, and even today, it probably would give them a, a good run for its money. But of course, games make a lot more now. Um, so one of the first two was Ball Blazer. Just curious, have any, has anybody here played Ball Blazer or Rescue on Fractalus? All right, a few hands, but not many. I'll go through these fairly quickly. As I said, we've got a lot of slides. Uh, Ball Blazer uh, was a sport game. It was actually a uh, two-player, uh, which was really unusual at the time, with a split screen. And you know, this cover of computer games there, look at this really beautiful, uh, it's called a rotofoil there. Uh, again, not that surprising by today's standards, but that is way prettier than you could do on a computer. And I'll explain how we got that kind of imagery. Um, David uh, did a game that was kind of like Star Raiders, which was a very popular Atari game at the time. They didn't, we actually didn't have the ability to make Star Wars games at first because the Star Wars license was tied up for video games with uh, 20th Century Fox and some other companies for a few years when we started. And at first we were really frustrated because we had come to Lucasfilm hoping to work on Star Wars. But it turned out to be one of the best things that could have happened for us because it forced us to be creative, come up with their own ideas, work out our own approaches and technology. And uh, I have to recommend that, that kind of constraint to push you to be creative rather than using somebody else's ideas. As, as Brian Moriarty, who I'll talk about later, uh, said, you, you can't bask in someone's shadow. So they wanted to see if fractals could work. Uh, this was sort of the state of art of uh, state of the art in in coding at the time. It's a, a VT100 terminal. Uh, we were using Sun microstations that were very advanced for the time, but are, are way less powerful than uh, probably the watches some of you are wearing. 
and a lot of that early coding was in um, assembly language, uh, 6502 assembly language for the Commodore 64s and Atari 800s that we were working on at the time. Uh, we, this is actually not the specific assembler that we use, but this was all I was able to find online that approximated it. And uh, pretty primitive stuff. Um, we only had uh, 48 or 64K of RAM for the whole game as it was running. And there was a floppy drive, but it was very difficult to load stuff off of that drive. You couldn't do it really in real time while you were playing the game. So we had some stages where the game would pause while it would bring in some other artwork. Um, and the displays at the time were very low resolution. They were character based for the most part. So you had a, a limited number of characters on the screen and graphics that you could use to substitute for the characters. We had a lot of ways that we would sort of hack around that to try and make it better. This is actually an interesting example of that where this was groundbreaking at the time because it was using a whole bunch of screen interrupts all the way down the screen to change those characters in real time as the, the scan line was sweeping down there. And it uh, doesn't perhaps look like much, but it was using the fact that the Atari had 128 colors compared to uh, you know, four or 16 colors on most of the other computers of the time. And using that kind of shading effect to give it a more of a 3D look. And uh, believe it or not, people would gasp when they saw just this uh, one screen. And I think it actually took the guy who worked on it uh, about two months to get everything running just for this one image. So you can imagine how slow processing was at the, in those days. And Rescue on Fractalus used fractals. The idea was that we were storing uh, a very tiny grid of, I think, uh, something like uh, was it 32 by 32 points with different uh, elevations. And the elevations were only uh, 0 to 127 or so, or maybe it was, it was 256. I forget how we did that. But the uh, fractals were used to give a sense of a mountains that were consistent. So as you flew in, it looked like you were flying into a, a mountain range. But we're only storing the data for individual points between the mountain and using fractals to uh, get a progressively more detailed view as you flew in. I don't have time to get into the full details of that, but uh, very groundbreaking for the time and uh, very archaic looking right now. One of the things that people remember from this game is that we had, you're picking up uh, uh, these, these pilots and some of them turned out to be alien monsters and you had to be ready to start your shields again and fry them. The fact that he had a green helmet was a giveaway that it was an alien and not a, uh, a human. Uh, one of the little Easter eggs there is that if you watch at the moment that he's electrocuted, he's got these strange symbols on his chest, the alien language, but if you tilt your head, you actually see it's the initials of the four people who were the, the lead uh, coders on the game. And uh, we had that secret. This was actually one of the big scare moments for a lot of people. There's a, a sound effect that comes with this that uh, had a lot of people jumping out of our, our seat, their seats. Uh, pretty primitive, as I say, at, at, uh, by today's standards, but advanced for the time. And it gives you a sense of the level of animation that was possible. So let's see. Uh, to do the manuals, we actually spent more on the manuals than a lot of people spent on their entire games. And we worked with ILM to do that. And in order to make the manuals look good, we basically used the same kind of techniques they were using for film special effects at the time. So they actually built these full-scale models. And, and David Fox, who is the lead programmer and designer on this, got to be the pilot who sat in the uh, uh, downed uh, spaceship here that had been blasted so that they could actually put him on the box cover. Uh, also had this beautiful model that was sitting in our offices for many years. They, the model makers basically had hundreds of boxes of all the different sort of spaceships and tanks and skyscrapers you can imagine. And a lot of the things like the Death Star and the original uh, movies were constructed using a lot of pieces from these things. And this one was a combination of several different model kits that they would uh, hacked together essentially to create something new. And this was uh, the concept for the Valkyrie fighter that you flew. Looked much better in the manual than it, you know, you never really saw it uh, in any detail in the game. Same kind of deal with that rotofoil I mentioned that was in Ball Blazer and a little flying saucer that was your enemy in Rescue on Fractalus. Uh, that's the Ball Blazer cover that, uh, you know, is how we got it to look good on the cover. And here's the saucer and close up in the actual game. You can see just at the top of the screen there, you could just see it off in the distance. And 
This was actually the high resolution version for the, uh, uh, the box cover, not actually what you see in the game. In the game, it was even uh, less detailed. So a little bit of overkill in terms of how good the stuff looked just for the manual and the graphics that, that went with it. But it was a lot of fun. That's a close-up of, of that same saucer. Uh, ILM is amazingly good at getting every detail right, even if you end up having uh, the, the uh, joke at, in Hollywood was that ILM stu stood for I love money because they were so expensive to work with. So a lot of Easter eggs in the game. Uh, the team appeared on the box and on the manual. Uh, that's David Fox actually in the suit in the front of it, so that was one of the bonuses he got to actually be on the cover of the box. Uh, he's also in the back there. That's him uh, looking as like the down pilot. So that, that shot up um, uh, cockpit I showed you before, this was the one place that it appeared uh, just for the back of the box cover there. I joined the group as they were starting to test this game, and that's second from the right. That was me with considerably more hair. Um, they had us dress up and did a little photo shoot like, like these pilots who had been shot down and had a rough time and they wanted us to, to look really dirty so they had somebody had been smoking cigarettes and they took some of the cigarette ash and put a little water and said here smear some of this on your faces and it's like okay this is showbiz except for Dave Levine there. Uh, Dave was like too cool to put ash on his face so it looks like the rest of us we tried to look like we'd been awake and shot down and you know I didn't shave for a few days but Dave looks like oh yeah this is great everything's everything's wonderful here um, let's see uh, anything else I can tell you about this let's let's keep going so the next set of games that we did uh, used the fractal engine because that was really our cutting-edge technology at the time and saved us a lot of time the idle on uh, that was Charlie Kellner's game, and here are a few si uh, uh, screenshots from there. So it was a, a kind of a Jules Verne-inspired uh, uh, plot. And this was the team that worked on it. Uh, Doug Crockford on the left is today better known for having created uh, JavaScript and uh, done a lot of work with Java. Uh, and that's uh, Gary Winnick in the center and Charlie Kellner. Uh, Gary uh, has done a lot of artwork for almost all the games in those early days and he was the head of our art department uh, after we had enough uh, games to hire more than one artist and uh, you'll be seeing him again. And then uh, my first game there was Coronas Rift. Uh, this game was uh, in some ways a, a, a kind of precursor to first person shooters. You're, you're driving a uh, futuristic tank across this landscape where a bunch of alien races had been fighting for many centuries and a lot of the wrecks of their uh, tanks were, were left on there and you would actually have to acquire better shields and weapons uh, from the tanks that you find even as you're under fire from these alien uh, spaceships that are coming after you. And we had a, a robot that helps you, you know, look at the things that you found from the, the tanks and, and acquire them give you a quick sense of some of the screenshots there. These are our Commodore 64 screenshots. This was our, our first game that used the Commodore 64 heavily. And I hired a game, uh, I hired a uh, game developer to work on the Commodore 64 version called Ron Gilbert. And Ron went on to uh, uh, do the Maniac Mansion games. And to do that, he hired Tim Schaefer, who's now well known for uh, Psychonauts and, and starting the company Double Fine. Uh, also, uh, you know, Brutal Legend and quite a few other games. So yeah, this was our team. That's me on the right, uh, Ron on the left, and Eric Wilmunder in the middle. Uh, Eric actually did a lot of work with Ron on what was called the Scum System, which was our adventure game uh, scripting system that I'll talk about later. And uh, this was what the screens looked like on the Atari 800 that had a lot more color range than the Commodore 64. There's a Commodore 64 for comparison, and that's the Atari 800 version. And we liked the graphics on the Atari 800, but the Commodore 64 was slightly cheaper and ended up completely outselling the Atari 800, which, by the way, is a great lesson from now and forever that the second best technology that costs less is often the one that's uh, really successful. So if you're trying to bet on something in the future, that's a, a good way to go. 
and this, I just stumbled across it uh, yesterday as I was looking at stuff. Someone has done a, a retro remake, uh, and this was done fairly recently. A lot of those games had cult followings, and I still stumble across people who have been uh, making new versions of these games just on their own for fun. Then um, I assume, actually, how many of you saw my keynote yesterday? Okay, great. So a lot of people have asked me, what was that video about and the Habitat thing? And I couldn't quite understand, was that a commercial or, or whatever? And Habitat uh, it was the very first graphic massively multiplayer game. You know, not particularly massive. I think at its peak, it had about 300 users. Uh, but with 300 users, it was bringing the entire server farm of Quantum Link, the uh, system that, that it ran on, uh, to the ground. And one of the reasons you haven't heard about it is because it used so much of their bandwidth, which was trivial by today's standards, but uh, quite a bit at that point, that they realized that they couldn't release it as such and had to scale it way back. So it never really came out in this version and this name. But uh, Chip Morningstar, who um, I haven't shown you a picture of him yet, but Chip uh, was the lead architect behind this and just a brilliant guy, did uh, a lot of our tool systems and uh, was able to figure out how to use multiple levels of interrupts and with just uh, 300 baud modems, you know, 30 uh, bytes a second of, of data transfer to be able to figure out how to have uh, hundreds of people all uh, operating in the same virtual world at once. Uh, and the people have then went on to build things like Ultima Online, Asheron's Call, EverQuest. Uh, a lot of them were, were borrowing on some documents that the guys who did Habitat did about things that they had learned in those days. And I could easily do a whole talk just about that. But one of the nice things is, is that just this year, Habitat's finally been restored since it ran on those custom servers. And those not only had that been proprietary software, but nobody makes those servers anymore. And they couldn't even find, they found one actual working copy they could acquire and use that to help reverse engineer some of it. And earlier this year, they finally were able to get that going again. And you can find out more at neohabitat.org if you're interested in, in cyber archaeology, uh, as it were. So uh, next game that the group did was Labyrinth. Uh, this was based on the, the Jim Henson movie. And it was uh, exciting for us because uh, we still were waiting for the rights to expire for Star Wars and Indiana Jones. But this was the first Lucasfilm uh, created movie that we were able to do. It was a David Bowie movie. Uh, I never got to meet the guy. Actually, I don't think he came by at all for the game side of things. The only connection we had with his um, uh, team was that they sent us uh, the Pantone colors of his eyes. His, his left and right eye were famously of different colors. And they said, when you recreate this, we want you to get these colors exact. He's pretty particular about it. So they told us you know, the exact shade. On the Commodore 64, we had 16 colors. And, and none of them were even close to that. You know, the, the, the story was 16 colors, all ugly, except for black and white. Those were, those were pretty good. Um, and to make it even worse, the resolution was so small that typically to do any characters, we'd, they had two pixels, you know, one for each eye, and they were both black. And we said, uh-oh, is this going to be a deal breaker? But happily, they said, yeah, don't worry about it. Nobody's going to see your game anyway, so do whatever you want. So this was the cover of the game. Uh, it was uh, actually Jennifer Connelly's first film as well. And I remember telling people, yeah, I don't think she has much of a future. So uh, don't go to me for uh, advice on casting. Um, this is what the game looked, looked like. You can see uh, the single pixel eye, uh, eyeballs, their uh, pupils. And this was uh, one of our first experiments in interactive storytelling. And we had what was uh, called a sort of slot machine interface. You could scroll up and down for a verb and a noun. And up until that point, a lot of these games had been done with text parsers. So you would say, you know, ask man or ask whatever. You didn't really know what he was. But you know, in this case, Hoggle was the character's name. And you didn't have to guess. You actually had a list of what possible things you could do. And we thought that was a big improvement over the, the parsers that often you really weren't sure what it, what it was. And much harder to do translations because you had to work out um, not just different words, but sometimes uh, totally different phrasing and structures. So next thing was uh, in 86, we moved to Skywalker Ranch. And Skywalker Ranch was uh, built 
just uh, uh, opened up actually the, the very year we moved in, but was built in the early 80s with money that George had made on his first two Star Wars movies. I think he spent about 100 million on it originally, and I don't know how many untold hundreds of millions since then. It's been, been growing and growing ever since. And uh, absolutely beautiful place. Uh, it was just a, a sort of fairyland to work in that uh, when I was at Google, the first day I was there, I was on a bus with a bunch of other people taking a tour, and one of the people next to me said, oh my god, this is amazing. Can you imagine a cooler place to work? And without wanting to disappoint him, I've sort of muttered under my breath, says, yeah, I can imagine something a little cooler. And uh, this was the entry. Uh, it was, it, they didn't want a lot of uh, people to show up. If anybody is a fan of the Big Bang Theory, they have an episode where they come up to Skywalker Ranch to go in. And in fact, they did a really good job. If, you, if you've been there, I, I could tell that they were doing a recreation. They didn't actually film it there, but they clearly had done their research because they, they pull up to this gate and they didn't show the address, uh, 5858 Lucas Valley Road. They asked us to keep that secret. Uh-oh. Uh so at any rate, we weren't very good at it in the, the games either. I'll, I'll hopefully get a time to go into that, but we loved dropping that number into all of our games and just, you know, it was an inside joke that only we knew about. Uh, there you go, close up of the gate with the address on there. And there were several levels of security, by the way, and, and what they showed in the Big Bang Theory was a bit fanciful, but uh, it is pretty much impossible to break in there. So just beyond that gate, there's the uh, Skywalker Fire Department. I happened to be there the day that that first fire engine, the one on the left, arrived, at, and actually not here, but at our other facility because Skywalker hadn't opened yet. And the story was, according to George, that, uh, and I'm, I'm sure this was true, but the reason that they got fire, uh, fire department of their own was that the insurance cost for this incredibly expensive ranch uh, was significantly uh, more expensive then uh, they would save more money by having their own fire department and lowering the fire insurance than they would by uh, you know, just using the fire department that was uh, 20 minutes down the road. Otherwise, just because if it started to burn, then uh, it would take forever to get there. But the reality was seeing George Lucas playing with his fire engine for the first time, I had a feeling that he was really looking for a good excuse to be able to, to buy one with the company logo there. Uh, and they were really beautiful. Uh, so this is a, a bird's eye view actually from one of the hills looking at the valley where the, the main section of Skywalker Ranch is. And you'll be seeing some of these buildings. This is the main house. I'll, I'll show a lot of pictures of that later. You can just barely see stuff up there. Our, the stable house where our group worked in was here. There were three or four other buildings all through this area. And this big one over here is called the Tech Building. Uh, and this was where the sound uh, post-production there. In the back there, there is a 300-seat theater and they're just beautifully appointed and uh, also a, a huge room where they had a full screen, actually about this size projection screen and room for an entire symphony orchestra to be set up in front of it with uh, acoustical tile all around so they could record. You know, it's where a lot of the, the music for not just Lucasfilm's movies but many others, if you ever see Skywalker sound, this is where the sound production is done. Uh, so just a gorgeous place. Uh, here's a view of the main house from uh, the lake that was nearby, a little man-made lake called Lake Ewok. Um, there was a raft out there, and in the summers you could go and swim out uh, to the raft if you liked. Um, there's another view from a different angle. And here's the main house a little closer up. And uh, I, don't, I haven't cut back and forth, but uh, Maniac Mansion, our, our, our first uh, real scum adventure game, was heavily modeled after this, and uh, in fact, if you played that game, you'll, you'll probably recognize not only the, the shape of the house with, with those uh, dormers and, and everything, but uh, also our library and the spiral staircase. This is my favorite room in the ranch. This, this spiral staircase here had, had two levels, um, beautiful stained glass that was done custom made at the ranch by, by artists that George hired. And uh, yeah, the staircase comes up later in the, the talk if we have time. This is from the second uh, level looking down. What, what you can't see, here's some more stained glass, is off to the left here is a, a, a malachite uh, stone uh, fireplace with an original Maxfield Parrish uh, print over it and big uh, leather chairs in front of it. It was one of my favorite places to go to think about stuff and uh, just a, an amazing environment to work in. 
And here's a little view of the dome that was overhead, another big stained glass masterpiece that they had to lower in from the top. And uh, during the summer, this was all bright and lit up. In the winter, it was uh, a bit cool and dark, but they always had a fire going in the fireplace, and the, the colored light from the stained glass would filter down. It was just an amazing place to be, and just one of many rooms in that house that were incredible. Uh, in fact, you can catch just a bit of the dome of what was called the solarium. There's basically a whole um, garden within that building, and it was a place you could go and bring your lunch. And at the base floor of that was a lot of the archives for the, the building. This is actually shot from the uh, balcony of the main house where you would often go and have lunch uh, uh, in between a work. This is the tech building I mentioned. In addition to all the sound production there, there was a storyboard for the ranch. Uh, how am I doing on time here? Oh, damn. Um, storyboard for the ranch that George had done of a fictitious background of it. And this was supposedly built in the 1920s, so it was done in an Art Deco style internally. And they then uh, built a, uh, basically grew a, uh, a, a grape arbory here. And there is a, they use these grapes now, and they've added a lot. All these hills have grape vines on them uh, in current day. This was, was quite a while ago. And they actually make a Skywalker wine uh, that uses the um, Italian uh, uh, phrase for Skywalker because uh, it sounds a lot classier for wine. Um, this was the stable house where the games group was in, and it was called the stable house because in that storyboard, this was where the horses were kept, and we tried not to be too offended by that. Um, but it was actually a wonderful, comfortable place. This was actually my office. It was uh, my friend Brian's uh, computer setup. You can see his classic uh, Mac there, and uh, the terminal over here was actually hooked up uh, through a computer to one of those workstations that I mentioned before, so we had extra compute power. And one of the little things that came up is that we got these, when we first moved in, there was no coverings on the windows, and as you can imagine, the sun shining in on the monitors made it impossible to work there. But George said, no, I'm sorry, we, I don't like the looks of shade, so we're not going to have them. It, it, it ruins the look of the room. And it's like, yeah, that really isn't going to help George. So there's a lot of back and forth, and you have to be careful when it's George Lucas, not, not because he, he gets angry, but he really cared about the aesthetics. And he found these uh, uh, shades that were ridiculously expensive, but, but fit his view of how that should look and, and fit in with the, the feel of it all. Um, this was a group of us probably around 1990. Uh, this is me over there. That was David Fox. Um, this is uh, Ron Gilbert. Uh, let's see, who else can I point out there? We, we have uh, 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 Martin uh, Bucky Cameron was one of our artists. Uh, at any rate, um, great group of people to work with. This was supposedly the watering trough that the horses were watered in, and of course this was all a fantasy, so there never were any horses. But one of the great things about having this as a central courtyard for the building is they were constantly crossing back and forth and we had some of our best design sessions standing out here around this watering trough. And I've, I've passed on to a lot of people designing creative spaces for people to work in companies where you want to have creative vision and do this sort of thing. And having a big central area that people are required to walk through is a really important thing. And I later found out that uh, Steve Jobs used that, that principle when he designed the, the current Pixar buildings. Uh, I don't think he got it from what we were doing, but those Pixar people, uh, like Lauren Carpenter, all originally came from uh, the computer division with us, so it very well may have been partially inspired by that. So lots of text here. Uh, as we started to get into the adventure games that I know a lot of you are more familiar with, so I'll, I'll try and spend some time on that. Let's see, I've got about 15 minutes left before I have to cut it off. Um, so I, I'll let you uh, uh, follow up on, on some of the, the background uh, on your own. I'll, I'll show you some of the pictures and give you a sense of it. The, the scripting utility we used was called the Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, or otherwise known as SCUM. And all of the tools that we had were then named after disgusting bodily fluids of one type or another. And we would torturously figure out why it was a good acronym. And this is just what happens when you let you know, the programmers come up with the names for the tools. Um, and lots of great features that, that were, you know, you probably heard the phrase point and click adventure games. And this was one of the major contributors to that, that name. Uh, it had uh, multitasking. It had cutscenes, which 
Uh, Ron actually coined the term cutscenes and the idea that you would, you would cut from an interactive scene to a, a, a cinematic one and back. It wasn't the very first game that did it, but it was the first one that actually popularized it. And the scripting language compared to the uh, assembly language I showed you is much easier to work in, and we're able to, to have it compile out to different machines like Commodore 64, IBM PC, and later uh, Amstrad, um, the Amiga, many other computers. And some, here's some of the artwork from Maniac Mansion. Uh, Ron and, and Gary were the, the main people uh, uh, designing that, and they have teamed up again along with David Fox to work on uh, something called Thimbleweed Park, which just came out recently. It was a Kickstarter, and it's been doing quite well. The conceit there was what, if, what it would be like if there was a game that was made back in those days that was only found in a drawer and released now, so I'd recommend that if you like the old games. Uh, just zip through some of these concept art uh, pictures for the characters and trying to get a sense of what it would look like. Um, and there's a little reference to uh, one of the, the um, uh, jaggy monsters from Rescue on Fractalus. Um, this was our box cover, one of several box covers we did. A um, little hard to see there, but Dave, the main character, is actually uh, wearing, he's modeled after what Ron Gilbert was wearing one day. This is a Lucasfilm t-shirt and a, an Indiana Jones uh, denim jacket. Uh, but of course you can't tell unless you worked in the company and that was the kind of stuff we did all the time. Um, the back of the box, there's a whole story about this that I don't have time for. Uh, just say that the, the United States um, uh, being a somewhat prudish country, somebody complained about this one word lust on the back of the box and we actually had to change the whole box because it's a game for kids. How can you have lust on the back of the box? So pretty strange. A um, little bit about what the game looked like at the time just to give you a sense. The next one, Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders was one of David Fox's games. And again, there's a little picture of, of uh, David and, um, oh God, I'm spacing, uh, um, uh, Matthew Kane, who is his, his uh, co-developer there. Um, this is actually from the Towns Fujitsu uh, version of the game that, that was a, uh, Japanese computer that was one of the first 16-bit color computers on the market. Not very popular outside of Japan, and actually I don't think even a, a huge hit there, but we were working with them quite a bit, so we converted our games there in much higher resolution graphics. Uh, still looks primitive by today's standards, but looked a lot better. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, based on, on the movie. Uh, this was finally the first uh, uh, movie you know that we were after, the Lucasfilms, um, Indiana Jones and Star Wars licenses were the ones we most cared about. The X-Wing game, sorry I don't have time to, to get into that one, that was the first Star Wars game we were able to do. Uh, I did a little work on that particular game. But I was one of the three uh, co-designers of this game, uh, co-project leaders. Uh, no, not, not these three guys, they're actually known for some other stuff. Um, but here we are. So this is uh, Ron Gilbert, me, and David Fox. And this is David's office at Skywalker Ranch. One of the things I wish I had better pictures of is you can see there's some nice uh, artwork on the, the side there. And if you really know your Star Wars background, you might recognize that those are Ralph McQuarrie uh, reproductions of some of the original concept art that was done on the very first Star Wars movie, except they're not reproductions. They had all the original artwork and said, hey, do you guys want this up on your walls? And it's like, yeah, that would actually be pretty cool. So, and just above my desk, I had a picture that you can find in the, the books online of Luke Skywalker looking down on Mos Eisley uh, and with his binoculars in a scene from the first movie, except this was so early on that if you look closely at that picture, you'll see that Luke is not Luke. He actually has breasts because in the original concept, uh, it was a, a woman. And of course, they've finally gone back to that in the latest set of movies, but uh, to have a, a female hero. But George actually wanted to do that early on. And I, I forget the story on to why he was overruled. But it was so, uh, so much fun having all that original artwork. And we could rotate it around and, and pull stuff out of the archives just to stick it up on our walls. Um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, this is the graphic adventure. Uh, there were several versions of the game, but this is the one that we did at, at LucasArts. And uh, there were three of us who were co-project leaders. So one of the, uh, oh, that's right. So there's some, several scenes that were in the movie that 
we were working off of the script. We didn't actually see the movie until about three weeks before it was shown to the public, and that was uh, less than two months before we released the game. And we found out that a lot of the scenes that we would put into the game that were based on the movie had been cut from the movie. So that was a little distressing. Uh, we alluded to the opening of the movie where Indy is, is in the water um, off of Spain, I think, just by having him dripping wet, and we never really explained what was going on there. Uh, we had him boxing in his school, which was a major scene in the, the movie that they cut out, but we built it into the game, and there were a lot of boxing sequences in the game. Uh, we also uh, took some liberties with the exact movie uh, progression so that there were a lot of surprises for the player. Give you a few senses there. There was also a Grail diary that was packaged with this, and a little bit of trivia that the person who wrote a lot of the background for this, we tried to model it after the one that you see in the movie, but we added a lot of information to help you play the game. And I actually uh, ended up hiring my brother, which is you know pretty much the, the almost the definition of nepotism there. But uh, he had been a me medieval history major and was then a freelance writer, so he was actually perfect for this. And that was actually part of our copy protection because the game would be duplicated very easily. But if you didn't have the Grail Diary, it was hard to play. And that was a really beautiful piece of, of artwork and uh, memorabilia for the game. Here's some of the actual Grail Diary from the game, not from the movie. And let's see. So this is what the animation looked like in the game. Uh, pretty primitive, but it was actually state-of-the-art to have this sort of stuff going on at the time. And, uh, uh, you know, one animation in this game actually took up as much room as the entire original Maniac Mansion game uh, because we were progressing so quickly with um, more and more RAM and higher resolution colors to play with. So because there were three of us, we, very friendly, we're still good friends to this day, and, uh, but we still had to talk about, well, how do we do the credits? Who gets top billing? And this scrolls on from left to right. So you see Ron's name first, but my name is highest on the list, and then David gets to be in the middle in both directions. But that wasn't quite good enough for us, so we played around with random numbers that uh, one of the very few impasses we had in working on the game was usually we could resolve anything talking among the three of us, but I wanted to keep a serious tone at the end of the game, much like the movie. Ron wanted to just make it comic because he was getting tired and he, he loves comedy. And David couldn't make up his mind. He liked both of the approaches. So we set up a random number generator, and sometimes when you play the game, you get one. Sometimes you get another. And, and sadly, I wish we hadn't done this now, but we kind of mixed them around, so it's a little bit uh, schizophrenic at times. But this gives you a sense of some of Ron's dialogue, where it was uh, pretty tongue-in-cheek, where she um, goes through the, the thing and, you know, nice going, Elsa, and, uh, you know, serious lines, but you know, he's complaining that he's going to have to be cleaning up the place for years afterwards. And when we finally got to the end credits, we didn't do the scrolling back and forth, but, you know, a third of the time it looked like this, a third of the time it looked like that, a third of the time it looked like that. And you can be sure that we actually went and checked the code since we we're all, you know, going in and changing the code all the time. It's like, all right, let's make sure this is, this is uh, kosher here. Uh, Loom was a game that uh, Brian Moriarty did. Uh, in fact, that shot I had of uh, our office, it's on his screen there in, in production. And this was actually a kind of a casual game long before those were popular, and it didn't do all that well, but if you can find a, a recreation version or a grand old games, GOG.games, uh, GOG.com rather, uh, I would recommend you take a look. It's a really clever game that uses music and magic uh, feels very much, in fact, like Harry Potter long before Harry Potter came around. Uh, but then Secret of Monkey Island. Um, all right, yeah, I know there's a lot of fans here. Um, this was actually one of my favorite games to work on. Uh, Ron hired Tim Schafer and Dave Grossman as brand new, we called them scumlets, because they were the, the people who would be the additional scum scripters, uh, both incredibly creative. Uh, Tim Schaefer went on to start Double Fine. Uh, Dave Grossman was head of, uh, was the creative director at Telltale Games through a lot of their rise to popularity, for example. So they've been very influential. Both very funny guys, uh, a lot of dry wit um, and good humor, and uh, a lot of fun there. This is what the game looked like, of course. Um, this was uh, one of my favorites. This is a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle. And uh, we were talking, I remember that, that design um, 
brainstorming session, we were, um, oh, I've got to talk faster. We were sitting around talking about how you could slide down a pole and is there anything we had in our inventory that you could use and what would be a funny thing. And somebody said, well, a rubber chicken would be really funny. Uh, you could fling the rubber chicken over the, the line and slide down. And somebody else, and the thing is, I, none of us remember who came up with this, but I remember here clearly that you know, somebody said, yeah, but a rubber chicken, it's rubber, it wouldn't really slide down the pole, you know, so we can't use a rubber chicken. And someone, and I'd like to think it was me, but it probably wasn't, said, yeah, but what if it was a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle? And the whole room broke into laughter because that just made no sense at all. And that was it, that was perfect. Um, so we also had the boxing that had been cut from the film, but was a, 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 had been a major part of the Crus Last Crusade game. And Ron came to me and said, you know, let's use that boxing game for your, um, for, uh, for our, our pirate sword fighting here, uh, because, you know, it actually, it's a boxing interface. It would be great for a pirate sword fighting interface. Well, I had actually designed and coded the boxing interface. What I neglected to tell Ron that I had actually kind of stolen the idea and I had stolen it from Sid Meier's Pirates because it was a pirate sword fighting game. And I said, if we use that for pirate sword fighting, everyone's gonna know it came from pirates. And it's like, ah, oh, well, what do we do? And we brainstormed about that and Ron had had us watching movies and uh, Princess Bride was one of the ones that we really enjoyed. And I was thinking about the fact that, you know, a lot of those movies, it wasn't the sword play, it was what they said to each other that was fun. So that's where the whole insult sword fighting came from and it's my major contribution to the game. And uh, if you haven't ever played it, this makes no sense, but if you have, those are the people that were laughing there. Um, then after that, we wanted to do a new Indiana Jones adventure because it was more successful. The Last Crusade was the most successful adventure game that we had done to date. Uh, so Hal Barwood, who had recently come from the film uh, side of things, he was actually the, the co-ghostwriter on Close Encounters of the Third Kind and uh, wrote, a, wrote and produced a movie called Dragon Slayer, which was a wonderful early fantasy movie. So he and I, uh, looking very stern here from about seven or eight years ago when we collaborated on a Mata Hari game, uh, we were looking at some other scripts that they had, but that was pretty terrible. So we went back to that beautiful library and used the, the things. In fact, I remember specifically there were some great books here we used for mythology to find out what is Indiana Jones going to look for this time. And it kind of boiled down to two possibilities. We came up with Atlantis pretty early on, but we didn't want to stick there. And we were also thinking about Excalibur, King Arthur's sword, but we realized that that would probably have to take place almost exclusively in Great Britain and it wouldn't be all that interesting. So we stuck with Atlantis and made this game. Uh, Hal was the, the project leader. He and I were co-designers on it. Um, give you a couple ideas of the screenshots. It's been redone as a, a, a cell phone game. This was actually a um, uh, early uh, version, as you can tell from the power plug for um, iPhone and, and then Android. Uh, there was a, a comic book that was made on it. It was a lot of fun to work on that. Uh, one of the, the last projects I worked on at LucasArts was The Dig, uh, which went through a lot of iterations. Um, I won't get into much detail because I'm running out of time. I'll just say that uh, there was a, an, a, the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 was uh, to, you know, at this point, the last really big earthquake in the Bay Area. And it happened uh, uh, just a few minutes after we were in the, the main house. This was a beautiful conference room that, there with a huge mahogany desk. And they had announced that I was going to be the project leader on the dig. And uh, a few minutes later, the earth started shaking, which probably was a good sign that we should have heeded. Uh, we all ended up piling under this desk and, um, you know, weathering the earthquake. It was, it was pretty dramatic. Um, but it went on to other project leaders. There were actually four of us who worked on it over, over time. Ended up looking quite different. The version I had was uh, much closer to Steven Spielberg's original vision, which was uh, kind of a combination of the movies Treasure of Sierra Madre and The Forbidden Planet. Uh, this is an alien daycare center. Uh, this is stuff you've probably never seen because it never came, it never was in the game that was released. And this gives you a little sense of how these were made. The artist would make a very wide picture. This was one screen, but you would just paste these other things on there to do some of the animations and change this picture. It was very easy for them to cut and paste and make sure that they were lining up properly. 
I'm almost out of time here, and I, I realize I've run out of time for um, questions. Uh, so as I go outside, I will, will um, be happy to talk to people this afternoon or tomorrow if you catch me about any questions you have about games I've missed or more details. A few quickies, uh, a lot of in-jokes. We had uh, chainsaws were a running joke. There was a chainsaw in Maniac Mansion, but when you find the chainsaw, it's out of gas, and you never find the gas. But then when David did Zach McCracken, you find a can of gas that's labeled for chainsaws only, and there are no chainsaws in that game. Um, we had a lot of posters in our game, and because we did multiple versions of these games, sometimes the older games had shots for newer games in them, depending on which version it came out in. Here's Zach McCracken looking at a, a Maniac Mansion uh, poster. Here is a Maniac Mansion uh, person looking at a Zach McCracken poster. Um, and you know, referring to the good old gas can on Mars. Um, this is Zach McCracken with a Rescue on Fractalus poster. Uh, and here is an Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade poster. And uh, let's see what was going on here. Oh yeah, there's a, a Meteor poster here from Maniac Mansion. Um, all sorts of these things scattered through there. Oh, and uh, look at that street number that he's at. Isn't that interesting? I wonder where that came from. Yeah. Uh, here's that spiral staircase in the library. You can see the similarities there. And this ref refers to Chuck the Plant. Chuck shows up in almost every Lucasfilm adventure game somewhere or another. Um, that was Last Crusade. This is Day of the Tentacle. Uh, Chuck the Plant actually has a major role in that game. This was uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And there's a whole bunch of references to other games of LucasArts and some of the movies. Uh, this is actually one of my favorites was um, this is a thousand year old falcon. It's a millennium falcon. Ha ha. Um, so let's see. And uh, one of my lines that I'm proud of, I snuck into uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and was in many other games, was I'm selling these fine leather jackets, partly because Lucasfilm would sell us leather jackets with the Indiana Jones logo, and we'd have to buy them if we wanted them for, for ourselves. So this was our little bit of a dig at, at that. Um, this is a Monkey Island making a joke about Loom. Ron and Brian had a little bit of rivalry, and Ron made a lot of fun of Brian and his games in um, uh, Monkey Island. Uh, and even though he's advertising them, yeah, this uh, Bob and Threadbare, Are You My Mother, was a, a theme in, in several of uh, the, the uh, Monkey Island games. And all right, this doesn't make any sense to you now, but it was interesting for the uh, first time. And now let's see. Okay, so some of the stuff that, that I've worked on, that Ron's worked on since then. But I'm going to stop it at that. We're just about out of slides anyway, so I got through them even if I didn't leave time for Q&A. So I hope you enjoyed that, and please come in and talk to me outside if you want to uh, get any more information. Thank you.